Okay, um, what we're going to do now is discuss the uh, anatomy of the frontal recess and the frontal sinus. Um, this lecture is based on uh, work that we've done looking at the anatomy. I think it's, um, it's really important to understand the anatomy in the frontal recess. It's a very difficult part of uh, the, the dissection. It's probably the most complex. It's where everyone, I think, creates the most problems for the patients postoperatively. And I think that it's been mystified by a lot of surgeons. If you'll go to the American Academy, uh, you'll see that the, uh, the big names uh, will stand up and say, uh, you shouldn't operate in the frontal recess. Uh, it's too difficult. Uh, you should leave the frontal recess alone. Um, it's not some, uh, you should only leave it to the experts to do. My feeling is that if, if you understand the frontal recess and that you build on your knowledge progressively, that you should be able to operate in the frontal recess. The, um, the teaching that we have for ear surgery, now the anatomy of the, of the ear is very complex. We know that the anatomy of the middle ear space, the temporal bone, the, the facial nerve, is extremely complex surgery. Yet all ENT surgeons should be able to do mastoidectomies and, and ear surgery. And we all go and do it. Now, it's because that the teaching of ear surgery has been very good and the teaching of the anatomy in the ear has been very good. But now we say to the ear, nose and throat surgeons, you shouldn't go and operate in the frontal recess. The anatomy there is too difficult. I don't say, I don't buy that. I think that, um, that if we teach it properly and if you understand it and that if you progressively increase your expertise and don't go and try and tackle the most difficult case first, that we all should be able to operate in the frontal recess and that our training in Adelaide, we would expect all of our trainees when they finish their training at the end of their training program to be operate very comfortably in the frontal recess, all of them. So we feel if the training is good enough, then you should all be able to do it. So that's just a philosophical approach to start off with. What I'm going to concentrate in this particular lecture is uh, the relationship of the agonase cell and the unsnit. Uh, we're going to look at how those two sit together. We're going to look at all the frontoethmoidal cells and there's a lot of different configurations that can occur in the frontal recess. We're going to go through each one of those sequentially and uh, identify them in their increasing complexity. And we're going to look at the various approaches that you can use to the frontal ostium to, addre uh, to address these various different configurations. The next thing we're going to do is concentrate quite significantly on the three-dimensional reconstruction of the anatomy. And the analogy that we're going to use here is uh, children's building blocks. You know, if you give little building blocks to a child and get them to stack them one on top of the other, we're going to try and use uh, the building blocks to recreate the cellular structure in the frontal recess. So we're going to go through that with a number of examples and uh, see if whether you can reconstruct the anatomy yourselves. So if we look at the agonase cell and the unsnit relationship, the agonase cell is the cell that you can see before you can see the middle turbinate. You can just start to see a little bit of the middle turbinate on this side, agonase cell on this side, agonase cell on that side. So it's the cell that's anterior to the middle turbinate. And there's only one of them. There's not a number of agonase cells. There's normally only one single agonase cell. Aga means hill, and it means it's a, it's a curve or a hill anterior to the middle turbinate in the lateral nasal wall. If you look at this uh, on the parasagittal scan, you can see the agonase cell as it sits up against the frontal process of the maxilla. Sitting up against there, there's the anterior face of the bulla and the frontal sinus draining above that agonase cell. If you look at Stamberger's original book that he published in 1991, where he looked at the unsnit process, and in that book he made this drawing in which he showed that the unsnit process can implant on the lateral nasal wall in 85% of cases. And he said in other 15% of cases the unsnit process will implant on the skull base of the middle terminal. And that's everyone is familiar with that diagram. But what we're not familiar with is how does that agonase cell and that unsnit process relate? Is there any relation to the upward continuation of the unsnit process and the agonase cell? Is there any relation at all? Now that's not well described in the literature. But if you draw the agonase cell in, you'll see that the agonase cell sits and the unsnit process 
forms the media wall and the roof of that agonese cell. So that the Anzner process has an intimate relationship with the agonese cell because it forms the media wall and the roof. But it doesn't form the media wall and the roof of the entire agonese cell. It only forms the media wall and the roof of the posterior half of the agonese cell. So if you did a CT scan through here, you'll be able to see the agonese cell and you won't see any unsnit process at all. If you think about the first CT scan I showed you, anterior to the middle turbinate, you'll see that there's an agonese cell, no middle turbinate yet, and there's no unsnit there that you can see. But in the posterior half of that agonese cell, the unsnit continues up and forms the medial wall and the roof of that agonese cell in a significant proportion of patients. Not all of them, but in a significant proportion of patients. We're now looking at a series of uh, d d dissections, surgical dissections. We're now on the patient's right side. This is the middle turbinate. We're looking up with an angle degree telescope into the frontal recess from below. This is the cut edge of the unsnit process where we've made that uh, horizontal incision for the uh, swing door technique of unsnectomy. So you're looking at the cut edge of the unsnit process. You're looking up into the agonese cell and you can see that the uh, unsnit process as it goes upwards is forming the medial wall and the roof of that agonese cell. And as you move, remove that progressive unsnit process insertion and expose the frontal sinus, you are removing the medial wall and the roof of the agonese cell. If you look at this a CT scan, which is a scan done of this cadaver specimen, you can see that um, on this cadaver specimen you've got an agonese cell present here. Yeah? And you can see there's the unsnit process. And you can see how on, the CT scan, on this cadaver specimen the unsnit process comes up and it forms the medial wall and the roof of that agonese cell. You can just see that you can't just see the unsnit, unsnit it's just coming up. You just enter it, the unsnit, but the unsnit's forming the medial wall and the roof of that um, agonese cell. And the frontal sinus is draining down medial to that agonese cell. If the agonese cell pneumatizes significantly, so if it expands, if the agonese cell is significantly pneumatized, it will push that unsnit process until that unsnit process inserts on the middle turbinate. Now there's no gap between that agonese cell and that um, uh, middle turbinate. So if you were going to do this dissection, you'd have to be going behind, posterior to the, the uh, agonese cell because there's no pathway between that unsnit process and the middle turbinate. So if you look at a, an operative picture, you can see that this is the agonese cell. It's a very significantly pneumatized agonese cell and the unsnit process inserts on the middle terminate and there's no pathway. There's a pathway here behind but there's no pathway at the back. This is the natural ostium of the agonese cell where it just drains into the frontal recess. All the cells in the sinuses communicate as you well, are well aware. So the next important concept in the anatomy of the frontal recess is to do a three-dimensional reconstruction of the anatomy. So for each cell in the frontal recess you have a building block. So we have a building block for the agonese cell and any additional cells that might sit in that frontal recess we put them together in building blocks. But it's not only important to concentrate on building blocks, in other words the cellular construction, but it's equally as important to look at the drainage pathways of the frontal sinus around those building blocks. And we're going to show you that because the key to frontal recess surgery is to path, pass your instruments along the pathway and remove the cell. You don't want to be passing your instruments through the roof of the cell. So as soon as you've got to break through a roof of a cell, you're in danger and you have, the patient's in danger. Because if you've made a wrong decision and the roof of that cell is actually the skull base and you're starting to push an instrument through it, you're going to get a CSF leak. So you don't want to do that. You want to identify where is the pathway and slide the probe up along the pathway, no resistance to the probe, and then fracture the cell out the way. And then that removal of that cell will clear the pathway and clear the drainage pathway of the frontal sinus. So if we look in this particular patient, we've got an agonese cell, and as we follow that agonese cell back, we can see that it's pushing that unsnit process out initially to implant on the, on the middle turbinate, 
And then as you go further posteriorly, you can see that the, um, the, there's a pathway now between the back end of that agonase cell and the middle terminate over there. But there seems to be just one single cell associated with this uh, CT scan. So what we've done is we've created a single building block for the agonase cell and we've got this light blue colour for the frontal sinus and the frontal sinus drainage pathway and we've plotted both the agonase cell and the pathway which goes behind. Of course you can see that there's no space for it to go medial, the pathway goes behind. So we're plotting both the cell and the pathway of this particular patient. As the complexity of the sinuses increases, where in this particular patient you've got an agonase cell sitting there and a Kuhn type 1 cell sitting above it and the frontal sinus starting to drain medially and anteriorly, we will plot those cells with building blocks and reconstruct that. So let's go through this particular example for this particular patient. Looking at the left side, which is this side, and going in this direction like that, you can see they're just starting to see the beginnings of the agonase cell here. Just starting to see the middle terminate with a large agonase cell and there's disease around the agonase cell and there's bubbles within the agonase cell. And as you go back you can see the disease within the agonase cell. The pathway is medial. You can see that you've got a medial pathway around that agonase cell. So we've got the agar cell and we've got the pathway coming down medially to that cell. So let's just look at the video and uh, evaluate the video to see if the video actually confirms what we could see on the CT scan. So we've got that cell which has got disease in it, a blocked pathway of the frontal sinus, some disease in the maxillary and the posterior ethmoids as well. So on the left hand side of the nose, looking up, you can see the agonase cell with mucopus inside the agonase cell and you can see that the pathway is medial to this cell so that we can, we can clear that mucus out of that cell and we can visualise that cell. The access for all surgery in the frontal recess is performed through this axillary flap technique which I'm going to go through for you. We raise a little soft tissue flap and tuck the soft tissue between the middle turbinate and the septum and once we've been able to tuck that flap in it exposes the anterior face of the agonase cell. It's really important to do this dissection and expose this upward continuation, that little bit of upward continuation of the middle terminate before you do uh, entry into that agonase cell. Using the hayjack coffler punch, which I mentioned earlier this morning, you remove the anterior wall of the agonase cell and that allows you to operate with a zero degree telescope. You can see we can use a zero degree telescope, we're not working around the corner, we're working under direct vision. It makes the whole surgical process that much, more, that much easier and more straightforward. So fracturing that cell out the way, exposing the frontal ostium, just put the cell back so you can see that's the, the upward continuation of the unsnip process which is forming the medial wall and the roof of that agonase cell. We'll remove that uh, roof and medial wall of the agonase cell and just expose the frontal sinus underneath that. Now this is the simplest configuration. The configurations don't get more straightforward than this. A single agonase cell in the frontal recess is the simplest configuration. All the other configurations are more complex than this one. This is this, these little bit of bone, bits of bone you should remove because if you leave these little bits of bone behind they can form granulation tissues and scar scarring. So once we've removed that agonase cell, we've cleared that frontal ostium, we don't need to do anything further in that frontal recess. So while the cellular structure is important, the drainage pathways are absolutely vital to identify. As I s said before, we're going to be passing instruments along these drainage pathways and not through the roof of the cell because that endangers the patient. So always attempt to identify the frontal sinus drainage pathway. And if you are uh, identifying the frontal sinus drainage pathway, try and plan your surgery such that you pass your instruments up that pathway and fracture the cells away from that frontal ostium. The Kuhn classification, Fred Kuhn uh, described this classification, I think it's quite a good one and uh, we tend to use this one. Uh, it's a, the number of cells, front ethmoidal cells, associated with the agonase cell. So the agonase cell is not in this classification, the agonase cell is separate 
But if you've got one cell, a single cell with an agacel, it's a coon type 1 cell. If you've got multiple cells, then it's a coon type 2 cell. If you've got a cell pushing through the floor of the frontal sinus, then it's a coon type 3. And if it's a, a coon type 4, it's an isolated frontal sinus cell. Now this is the only area where I differ with uh, Fred Kuhn. I don't believe you can get an isolated cell in the frontal sinus. They're all pneumatized from the frontal recess. But if you significantly pneumatize greater than 50% of the vertical height into the frontal sinus, then we call that a Kuhn type 4 to differentiate it from the Kuhn type 3. Then there's the intersinus septal cell, which is associated with the frontal sinus septum. And then the bullet frontalis cell, which is a cell pneumatizing along the skull base into the uh, frontal sinus on the posterior wall. So if we look at the Kuhn type 1 cell, so it's a single cell that sits with the agar in association with the agar. So let's look at the right side of this cadaver dissection specimen now. So you can see that you've got the agar cell here, which is sitting here, which is this one here. And then you've got the small Kuhn type 1 cell, which is sitting associated and adjacent with that um, agar cell. And the frontal sinus drainage pathway is posterior to the agar cell and that Kuhn type 1 cell. So a single frontoethmoidal cell more commonly will sit above the agar cell with a drainage pathway of the frontal sinus medial and posterior to that. That's the common configuration. A Kuhn type 2 configuration is a number of cells that sit with the agonase cell. It can be two, it can be three, any multiple number of cells will sit with the agonase cell. And they can sit in various configurations and they can push the drainage pathway of the frontal sinus in various directions. And it's important for us to do that three-dimensional reconstruction and identification of that drainage pathway so we can see that when the cell reaches the skull base that we might need to remove the roof of that cell to properly expose the frontal osteum. So let's go through an example. We're going to be looking at the left-hand side of this particular patient. So we're going to identify that you've got an agonase cell there and you've got a Kuhn type 1 cell there. And as we follow that, you can see that the frontal sinus appears to be draining anterior to that Kuhn type 1 cell. It's coming anterior to that Kuhn type, anterior medial to that Kuhn type 1 cell. It then starts to go backwards uh, behind that, um, the, the Kuhn type, uh, the agonase cell. And as you follow the Kuhn type 1 cell posteriorly, you'll see that this Kuhn type 1 cell is sitting up against the skull base. So there's no pathway posterior to that Kuhn type 1 cell. So you follow that cell back and you can see that that cell goes right back up onto the skull base. And there's the frontal sinus. The frontal sinus is not draining posterior to that cell. It's draining anteromedial to the cell. As we go further back, we reach the anteromedial artery, which you can draw in, and then the uh, bulla ethmoidalis, which is represented it here. So we've got a three-dimensional reconstruction of the anatomy of that frontal recess. We've got an agonase cell Kuhn type 1 cell, the frontal sinus drainage pathway anteromedial to the Kuhn type 1 cell before coming medial to the agar cell, and the uh, bulla ethmoidalis and a anteroethmoidal artery, which is a little bit on a mesentery uh, situated in this particular patient. So if you look at the video of this dissection, what we do is we create an auxiliary flap. We will then uh, raise that auxiliary flap, tuck it between the um, septum and the middle turbinate. Um, remembering that this bit of tissue here is the bit of tissue that you need to separate and identify this upward continuation of the unsnip process. Uh, if you don't do that, every time you put this suction in here, you'll suck your flap in. So this is the agonase cell. So we remove the, the back wall of the agonase cell. Remember I said it was the drainage pathway is medial to the agonase cell. So we remove the agonase cell. And then once we've removed the roof of the agonase cell, we look and identify the roof of the Kuhn, um, the Kuhn type uh, 1 cell, which is sitting up on the skull base. So we can see now that that's the drainage pathway. There's the drainage pathway. We slide anteromedial. There's the cell at the back. The cell's here. We slide it up anteromedially. We fracture it laterally and identify the frontal osteum. We can then remove the little bony fragments and you can see that there's no drainage pathway behind this Kuhn type 1 cell. It's the Kuhn type 1 cell was sitting right on the skull base. We then just tuck the flap back and the flap then nicely covers that uh, raw bone of the axilla and prevents scarring 
in this region in the post-operative phase. Then there's the Kuhn type 3 and the Kuhn type 4 cells. This is a good example of both in one patient. The Kuhn type 3 is a cell which is pushing through the floor of the frontal sinus from the frontal recess. And the Kuhn type 4, it looks like an isolated cell in the frontal sinus. So you'd say, yes, that, well, that follows Kuhn's definition of, of an isolated cell in the frontal sinus, but it's not an isolated cell, and I'll show you why in a minute. If you're going to be dis, uh, making the diagnosis of what is a Kuhn type 3 cell, the first decision that you need to make is where does the frontal sinus become the frontal recess? So if the cell is sitting in the frontal recess, then it's not a Kuhn type 3 cell. For it to be a Kuhn type 3 cell, it's got to push up into this area here, the floor of the frontal sinus. So it's got to push into that region there to be a Kuhn type 3 cell. So if you think about sequential CT scans, and you can see that where the CT scan is taken through this beak, this bony beak of the um, frontal sinus, you're going to have a continuity of bone, a horizontal continuity of bone. Where the scan is taken behind this beak, there's going to be no continuity of bone. So let me explain that a little bit further for you. So where you've got this continuity of bone, on the CT scan you're going to see a straight continuity of bone coming across. And where you lose that continuity of bone, you change from the frontal sinus to the frontal recess. You can see there's no bone coming across. There's no horizontal portion of bone coming across. So where you lose this horizontal bone is where you move from the frontal sinus to the frontal recess. So if you just look at this again, this scan is taken through this little bit of bone here. This bit of bone here is this bone here. Because it's taken, it's all the way through. It gives you that horizontal portion of bone there, which is this bit of bone here. This scan here is behind this bone, so there's no horizontal portion of bone. So you've moved here from the frontal sinus to the frontal recess. So you've gone from the frontal sinus to the frontal recess. So if you see a cell that peaks up above a horizontal portion of bone, then it's a Kuhn type 3 cell, because then it's peaking above this beak into the floor of the frontal sinus. So that's how you differentiate between a Kuhn type 3 cell and an ordinary cell. So if we go back to this scan here, this parasagittal scan is uh, of this side through here, and you can see that this cell there, that's got air in it, has pushed its way through the floor of the frontal sinus into the frontal sinus. So this is a Kuhn type 3 cell because it's gone above the beak from the frontal recess into the floor of the frontal sinus. That's a Kuhn type 3 cell and that's its parasagittal image. If you look at the parasagittal scan through this side, you can see that this cell, which is this one, has pushed its way up from the anterior face of the bulla. So it's actually a bulla frontalis cell which has gone up along the skull base so it's pneumatized from the bulla along the skull base. And when you've done a uh, coronal scan, you've just cut off the tip. You've just cut the tip of that cell off. So it looks like an isolated cell, but it isn't. It's a cell that's pneumatized from the frontal recess rather than a cell uh, which is isolated to the frontal sinus. So we are arbitrarily distinguish between a Kuhn type 3 and a Kuhn type 4 on the extent of pneumatization because that's a clinically and surgically important differentiation to make. Why is it clinically important? Because Kuhn type 3 cells can be removed from below through a normal fez endoscopic dissection, while Kuhn type 4 cells will often have pneumatized so extensively into the frontal sinus that you cannot remove them from below and you need an alternative approach to remove them either a combined external and uh, internal approach, a Lothrop procedure, or you may require an osteoplastic flap procedure to remove those cells from the frontal sinus. So the differentiation between a Kuhn type 3 and a Kuhn type 4 is made specifically on the surgical management of these. And what we've done is arbitrarily taken 50% of that particular CT scan. So any coronal scan that you take, doesn't matter which one that you take, if that cell extends more than 50% of that vertical height of that frontal sinus, then it would normally be a Kuhn type 4 cell and you would consider uh, alternative techniques for removal 
while as coon type 3 cells are normally removable through a standard technique. So let's look at a, an example. If we've got a series of patients here, we're going to follow this down on this left hand side. You can just start to see you've still got a continuity of bone. You can see that you've got that continuity of bone. So at this scan here, you're still in the frontal sinus. While this scan, you've lost that continuity of bone. You haven't got that anymore. So you're moving from the frontal sinus to the frontal recess here. And you can see that this cell, as you can see it here, is this cell here. So this is a Kuhn type 3 cell, which is pushing its way into the floor of the frontal sinus on this left-hand side. And it's narrowing the outflow tract of that frontal sinus fairly significantly. So if we do an anatomical reconstruction, what you can see is that the agonase cell is a small cell. So we draw a small little block for a small agonase cell. The Kuhn type 3 cell is a large cell which is pneumatizing past, this is the, 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 the frontal floor of the frontal sinus, past the floor of the frontal sinus and into the uh, frontal sinus floor. The frontal sinus is draining postromedially, so it's draining posteriorly uh, and medially. Important to identify, the, uh, po postrolaterally, sorry. It's important, important to identify that frontal sinus drainage pathway as well. So let's have a look at the video on that left side of this particular patient. So again, we will do the axillary flap to expose, and it's very important with the Kuhn type 3 cells that you make this fairly high up, because you want to take your surgical dissection as close up to the frontal ostium as you can, because you're going to be working a variable degree into the frontal sinus, and the more extensive that you need to work into the frontal sinus, the more room that is required up here to get you into that. So what we've got here is the unsnip process, the cut edge of the unsnip process, the small agonase cell, which we're going to remove in a second. And once we've removed that small agonase cell, we'll be able to identify the large Kuhn type 3 cell, which is pneumatizing up into the frontal sinus. So we're just going to take away the anterior face of the agonase cell. Um, and it, the thickness of this bone varies depending on the pneumatization of that agonase cell. The bigger the agonase cell, the thinner this bone becomes. So this is the small agar cell which we're just going to remove. Just take away the roof, the medial wall on the roof of that small agar cell and that will expose, there's the uh, Kuhn type 3 cell now. You can see this is the small agar cell here and this is the Kuhn type 3 cell. So now we can identify the Kuhn type 3 cell. That's not the frontal sinus, that's just the roof of the Kuhn type 3 cell. Now we need to say is where's the drainage pathway in this patient. So we know that the drainage pathway is posteriorly so we look in posterior for the drainage pathway. We see the pathway there. And we can slide the instrument up the drainage pathway and we can fracture the cell forward. And by sliding the instrument up, you can just start to see uh, exposure of the frontal ostium by removing the roof of that Kuhn type 3 cell. So once the roof of that Kuhn type 3 cell is removed, we can visualize the frontal ostium. And, um, and once we visualize the frontal ostium, we don't need to instrument the frontal ostium anymore. We've got a good clearance of that frontal recess and we don't need to do any more uh, surgery than that. We put the um, axillary flap back and uh, prevent the scarring in that axilla. What time are we breaking for lunch, Andrew? You've got 15 minutes. 15 minutes, okay. Let's have a look at the intersinus septal cell. So what you've got here is a patient with a frontal sinus, a pacified frontal sinus on this side. But here we've got a cell which is associated with this intersinus septum. See it here? And you can see now, when I, when I get my uh, registrars to look at the scan, I say to them, what are you going to see when you get into that frontal recess and you look up? Let's assume now that you've taken away the roof of that agonase cell. You've removed that roof of the agonase cell. You've got an angle telescope and you're looking up at the frontal recess. What are you going to see? And I'll get them to try and picture it before they actually uh, do the surgery. And what you're going to see, if you can think about what you're going to see, is you're going to see a septation, because you can see the septation there. You're going to see a septation, and you're going to see one opening medially going into this intersinus septal cell, and you're going to see one opening going laterally into the frontal sinus. So they've already got a picture of what they're expecting to visualize when they go into that frontal recess. And as you go further forward, you can see that this medial cell goes almost across the top and the frontal sinus is pushed down a bit anteriorly. But that's just a, a variation of the intersinus septal cell. 
If we look at the um, if we look at the axial scans, so when you're looking up, laterally you're going to have the frontal ostium, medially you're going to have the intersinus septal cell. Frontal ostium is going to be draining here. Intersinus septal cell is associated with this intersinus septum. This draining here. Intersinus septal cell gets bigger and pushes down the frontal sinus laterally as it goes up. So if you do a, a reconstruction, we've got the agonase cell, intersinus septal cell, frontal sinus, and the intersinus septal cell going across over the top of the frontal sinus. So if we look at the video of this patient, we'll do the axillary flap exposure again to, um, to remove the anterior face of the agonase cell. Uh, Again, just to emphasize, if you don't take this little bit of tissue away here, when you pass the suction in, you're going to suck the flap back all the time. But if you do a proper exposure, you won't have a problem. This pneumatized agonase cell, so the anterior face is very thin, as you can see there. A polypoid polyps within the agonase cell. If we remove the polyps, not the cell, just remove the polyps. And once you remove the polyps, you can identify the cell. You can see the cell walls nicely now. So leave the cell behind. This is the suction curette which I sh showed you earlier. So we put the suction curette up, remove that um, posterior wall. And once we've removed that agonase cell, we've got the suction curette going into the frontal sinus there and going into the intersinus septal cell there. So two pathways with that vertical um, um, septation between the two pathways. Intersinus septal cell, frontal sinus. You can see the two openings. As you would imagine they to them to be from looking at that CT scan. So we're going to take down a bit of that intersinus septum. Again, the giraffe through biting forceps, very useful instrument in this area to take down that um, that septum. And uh, we've got a mini trephine in the um, um, front, uh, intersinus septal cell there as well, just because the patient had significant opacification of those sinuses, and we wanted to make sure that we got all the muco pus out of those sinuses. It was quite a narrow opening. You can see the muco pus coming out uh, from that frontal sinus. So we really wanted to make sure uh, that we got all the muco pus out before, um, otherwise they get a recurrence very quickly uh, after the surgery if you don't remove all that muco pus. So visualization again of that um, intersinus septal cell and the frontal ostium once you've cleared those. And then put the uh, um, auxiliary flap back at the end of the procedure. Uh, and make sure that you drape it nicely over that um, axilla. Just another example of an intersinus septal cell. See the intersinus septal cell here. See it opening into the frontal recess, pushing and narrowing down the frontal ostium quite significantly. So again, imagine what you will see when you look up from below. This is the intersinus septal cell, which is this one here. This is the opening of the frontal sinus, which is quite a narrow opening, as you can see there. And that's all you need to do. You don't need to open that anymore. You've cleared the drainage pathway, so you don't need to instrument it or open it anymore. That's all you need to do. So what do you do if you recognize a difficult frontal sinus on the uh, CD scans? The surgical principles remain the same. You must reconstruct the anatomy. You must identify the drainage pathway. Then a curette or a probe is passed along that pathway and try to work away from danger. So if you push the probe in along the pathway, fracture the cell laterally. Fracturing laterally is fairly safe. Fracturing anteriorly is completely safe. You can't damage anything. You don't, you've got to be careful fracturing posteriorly and you should never fracture medially. Never. Because that's the thinnest part of the skull base. So work away from danger. Surgical exposure. Now the auxiliary flap has been designed specifically so that you can turn from the CT scan at any point in time and point to the CT scan and say, I'm currently operating in that cell. So if you think about the approach that we've put forward over the last half an hour, every single case has started with the opening of the agonase cell by removal of the agonase cell anterior and front wall. We've shown you that the agonase cell is very easy to identify on the CT scan. So you open up the agonase cell, you can say on the CT scan, I'm there in that cell now, because you know which cell you're in. You can then plan your opening of each sequential cell from that agonase cell. 
So the, the agonase cell is the key to unlocking that funnel recess because it's a, a cell that you can find in every patient and it's a very easy first step uh, along the technique. And, and that's why we advocate the auxiliary flap technique to expose that. You want to try and avoid using angled telescopes as much as possible. There's been good studies to show that the surgical difficulty increases with the angulation of the scope. It's much more difficult to operate with a 70 degree telescope than it is to operate with a 30, uh, with a 30 degree scope and it's much more difficult to operate with the 30 than it is to operate with the zero. If you, with the normal uh, instruments, you're going to be operating a long way away because you've got the implantation of the uh, middle turbinate. If you've got increasing angulation, you need to have increasingly longer and curved instruments to put that instrument in the middle of your surgical field. Because if you have an instrument that's not very angulated, you're not going to get the tip of that instrument in the middle of the surgical field. If you work with a zero degree telescope, it's a lot easier and a lot more straightforward. So the taking up the anterior face of that, um, uh, taking away that anterior wall of that agonase cell puts the surgical uh, dissection in the frontal ostium right in front of you and it allows you to work with significantly less, um, just the steps of the um, agonase cell, significantly less uh, angulation uh, than, is, than you would otherwise require.